And we're back with more bonus time for my Let's Get On With It Vampire the Masquerade Redemption playthrough. This bonus time, the end of the series, Future Grimmeth Willing, will be divided into two sections. The second will be my final thoughts. The first section will be literature, uh, primarily marketing from before the game's release, and a post-mortem about a couple of months after the game's release. But we're starting here with Vampire Online Help, a series of pages available entirely on the install disk. Just because something is presented in web page format does not mean it is online. Quit trying to deceive people, you 2,000 assholes. <laughs> As in, from the year 2000. Unbelievable. Anyway, you might recall me presenting the README last bonus episode. What if you could get it in this format? What if you could just stare at this and reflect on uh, the design of web pages sometimes? And the year of our Lord 2000. Ah, oh, again, exact same, but it could be red and white text on a black background. Yeah! Memories. Great. Let's have a look at some other things. Let's go into customer support. If you have any comments, questions, suggestions about this game or any other Activision product, please feel free to contact us. But do not contact customer support for hints or walkthroughs. Only technical support. You can search for hints on the web where many gaming sites will provide hints and FAQs for our game. There are also books you can purchase. And hints are not on the Activision hint line. Damn it. You get customer support for a variety of locations like North America. Note, multiplayer components of Activision games are handled via online only. And there you go. That's your fax number for that. When's the last time you faxed something? For me, I'd say it's been a bit over a decade. A reference for a friend. Or employment. Have you ever faxed something before? <laughs> uh, do you still fax to this day? I know of some locales where faxes are still in use. And you can go to, like, a supermarket here and there. Like a Piggly Wiggly. I think my local pig still has fax machine, but it's been quite a while. Since I have inquired. Hmm. Irrelevant. Tactical help. A vendor list. We have tried to include the most up-to-date contact information for major manufacturers of software, computers, video cards, sound cards, and other peripheral devices. If you, uh, you need to contact someone about, say, your Dell computer, well, there you go. They've got you hooked up with the details. What about Microsoft? For your operating system? Well, there you go. That covers that. Whew. Troubleshooting. Do I need the CD to play, key to play this game? Yes, you will need the CD key to play the game. When you first start the game, the game will request that you input the game's CD key before launching into the game. Without putting this code in, you will not be able to get into the game. Please store it in a safe place. I have mine. The CD key should be treated, treated like an like a ATM pin number or a password. You, you should not reveal it to anyone. Okay, so I should put it as a post-it note on my monitor. But it is way longer than a password from the year 2000. Come on, man. Come on. Uh, and then, my screensaver is running. Why don't we go with installing and uninstalling the game, common installation program problems. Will a virus checker affect the way Vampire the Masquerade installs? Yes, this was a problem in those days, too you young viewers. <laughs> Due to the large number of files in the game installation, users of Norton Antivirus and other virus checking programs may experience extremely long install times if the virus checking program is active when installing the game. If this is the case, you can first scan the CD for viruses for your peace of mind, disable your virus checker, install Vampire the Masquerade, then re-enable your virus checker. There we go. All right. Before the installation. I said that common install program would be the last thing we looked at there. Wanted to show up again. Vampire Online Help. Our next bundle of pages, 
I've I've decided to keep because of the adverts on display from Planet Vampire. If you're unfamiliar with Planet Vampire, uh, search engine foo may not help you so much here. Just know that uh, they joined the masquerade and cared deeply about uh, profligating knowledge of vampire-related materials. If you do know it, you likely know it more from Bloodlines than you do Redemption. We can see an advert here. Your mother. Bored. Ha <laughs> ha! Some character facts that were in the, the marketing for the game before its release, being well over 100 characters. We start off alone, we'll eventually have a party of four. Nihilistic will be using a soft skin animation for the characters, making them seem as realistic and lifelike as possible. You won't see any seams in the mode. Unlike usual run-of-the-mill polygonal characters, each character will possess their own unique physical features, as well as vampiric abilities, distinguishing each player within your party. You control the selected character's swing or firing of each weapon all in a real time, while non-controlled characters join the fray on their own. Vampire will stretch across four centuries and will end at the millennium, while starting back in the 12th century. What? Yeah, sure, okay. We start off in medieval Prague and Vienna, and we end up in the fucking sewers. As one does. Vampire will be using level maps that are interchangeable with those from Quake 2. You'll not only be able to create your own maps, the level editor will be included on the CD-ROM, but you'll be able to import actual Quake 2 maps that will make for some multiplayer mayhem. I... I don't know whether this is true. <laughs> I've never attempted it. Uh, this could just easily be marketing, like, jargon that ended up not panning out. Uh, I... I sincerely do not know the answer to this question. The missions involve a mix of puzzle solving, negotiation, and visceral com negotiation. They mean the pathfinding. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> I never reached acceptance with that. Sixteen different core missions with extremely large and detailed sub levels, and uh, some bits about the level editor. All right. Next off, we have Equip Your Expedition to Icewind Dale at Baldur's Gate Chronicles. A Q&A, a composer here for Vampire the Masquerade. And has done quite a bit of work as well in other theaters. Talks about how he got chosen to do the music in Redemption, what drove him when making the music for Redemption, what kind of setup did he use, any future projects that he's working on, that he didn't doesn't do any role-playing, but uh, Ray sat him down with plenty of literature before doing the music. What's the weirdest thing you've been asked to compose? I was just asked today to write some 60s lounge music for a website for an upcoming Disney film. I'm looking forward to doing that. I wrote Cotton Weary's theme song for his TV talk show in Scream 3. That was fun because I wrote some stupid cheesy piece of music that sounded like a Jerry Springer tune. Ugh. I hate that kind of music. Recently, I wrote the music for the trailer for a... and so on and so forth. Any classical or modern influences on your work for this production? Yeah. Mr. Stoker's Dracula and a few other related films. Got the feelings and the vibes. You think vibes is a new word? No, vibes has been around, bro. Got the vibes. What's your method of attack for writing a song for something like a video game? And then, uh, there we go. That's that. But really... It's all about how to equip your expedition for Icewind Dale. That is critical knowledge. And then a Q&A with Rob Hubner. We're, uh, we're going to be getting more words from Rob here at the end of this first broad section. Marketing. Lead programmer and vice commander over at Nihilistic Software. Which talks about the creation of the Nod Engine, as opposed to using an existing one, like Quake, Half-Life, or Unreal Engines. What kind of things does Nod feature? Well, realistic rendering of complex characters and worlds. The main thing we focused on was making the character rendering look really good, so that meant including fully skeletal, skinned bodies with automatic continuous level of detail and a nice set of rendering options. Also, the Wheel of Time based on the best-selling fantasy series by Robert Jordan. Now on PC. Click here. 
I got gifted the first three books of the Wheel of Time series this past Christmas. Obviously, knowledge of them have just seeped into my brain over decades of role-playing and video gaming. It's been osmosis. That and Robert Jordan is uh, somewhat of a celebrated local, we'll say, given my uh, given where I live. I uh, I did devour the first three books. I'm not going to go into a book review right now, and I am open to reading more. I'm not asking for you know a breakdown of your thoughts on that. I can always punch that shit into a search engine, but you know I just saw it there. It was an unplanned tangent. Anyway, offers you plenty of time and opportunity to learn about so many faces. And also, how many chucks could a woodchuck chuck if a woodchuck could chuck wood? <coughs> we learn about how large and detailed can a level a level get in the Nod engine, and how does that affect load times? It's worth noting, Vampire the Masquerade Redemption had some stiff system requirements, uh, and its release in mid two thousand, which challenged many of the computers consumers owned. My brother's computer was the only one that could run Vampire the Masquerade Redemption uh, when the game came out in mid-2000. It was not for everyone. As a matter of fact, we can even look at the system requirements. A 3D graphics accelerator, that's important. A 100% Windows 95-98 compatible computer system, including compatible 32-bit drivers for CD-ROM, video card, and sound card, and input devices, 233 megahertz Pentium 2R processor, 64 megabytes of RAM, US version of Windows 95 98 operating system, requires DirectX 7, included or higher, requires 720 megabytes of uncompressed disk space, plus an additional 80 megabytes for the Windows swap file for the minimum install. Medium install will require 945 megabytes of uncompressed disk space, plus an additional 80 megabytes for the Windows swap file. A full installation will require 1.25 gigabytes of uncompressed disk space for game files, plus an additional 80 megabytes for the Windows Swap file. Quad speed CD ROM drive! And then, of course, you have your multiplayer requirements down there. And then, yes, 3D graphics accelerator required. This being a pretty big hang up for folks, as was the case in my household. Talked a bit about. A dynamic LOD system that keeps the frame rate high by automatically scaling down the detail of characters in the distance. Does this mean the NOD engine can handle large outdoor areas, i.e. forests? Huh? Can we say that? that? Must be true. And then, uh, why is it called NOD? Why not GDI? When we named it, I totally forgot about the NOD from Command & Conquer. Actually, in the Vampire the Masquerade universe, the Book of NOD is sort of a sacred text that describes the nature of vampirism and the history of kindred. So it plays an important role in most vampire campaigns. I just thought it sounded like a cool name. If it's a license and it's short to type. We now have something from the IGN Vault. Vampire the Masquerade interview. Among the most intriguing new titles heading into this year's E3, this is a year before the game's release, is Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. Under development at recently formed nihilistic software by an accomplished team whose combined credits include Jedi Knight, Descent, Starcraft et al. Et al. Et al. The game has been kept largely under wraps pending the show. However, the information and images revealed to date have been very impressive. Add the fact that it's based on the very popular pen and paper Vampire the Masquerade Wolf world from White Wolf, and the result is a great deal of curiosity and anticipation. Consequently, I was very pleased to learn more about Nihilistic and their game from the company's President Redemption's project leader, Ray Moongod Gresco. Please introduce Nihilistic to our readers. Who are the core members of the Redemption design team? And what are their principal areas of responsibility? An independent developer formed a year ago. A small team of hand-picked and experienced talent to create gains without the politics and restrictions from a large company. And then goes into a breakdown for what it is. But that gives you a sense of, like, Nihilistic Software's newness, but what the individual members worked on before working on Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. 
We've had the opportunity to work on many great titles before forming Nihilistic, including Jedi Knight, Starcraft, Requiem, the Quake series mission packs, Dissolution of Eternity, and Ground Zero, Dark Forces, Descent, Shadows of the Empire, and Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine, among others. A lot of us were and still are enthusiastic pen and paper gamers. Rob actually has credit playtesting for the Advanced Dungeons and Dragons 2nd Edition rulebook. Does he? Shit, I might have to crack open my books and see whether <laughs> there's a name credit listed there. <laughs> I have to admit that with the production of Vampire the Masquerade Redemption taking over most of our time, I've fallen into more reading of some of the new texts than actually playing. We're into a lot of different types of computer games, too, as far as RPGs go. The list would definitely include recent titles like Baldur's Gate, Fallout, Diablo, Might and Magic, along with older classics like The Eye of the Beholder, Bard's Tale, and the Ultima series. For the benefit of readers who aren't familiar with Vampire the Masquerade, tell them about the pen and paper game. Vampire the Masquerade is an extremely popular pen and paper role playing game, second only to AD&D, created by White Wolf Games. The background is set in the world of darkness, an alternate reality based on the real world, but one in which vampires exist and which evil is more palpable and ubiquitous. For those unfamiliar with the license, the most innovative feature they will notice is White Wolf's unique treatment of the subject matter, which shatters the Dracula shtick themes used in most vampire related material. In Vampire the Masquerade, vampires collectively called kindred are part of separate bloodlines called clans, which are distinguished by unique vampiric powers and subtle pseudo-political agendas. The license also expands role-playing into an entirely new realm with conflict that exists on a personal level as a player struggles with her vampiric nature, and her personal level as the players become involved in the twisted machinations and power plays of the undead. At an overall level involving conflict between kindred of varying ages and power, and ominous pseudo-religious portents and legends. The main focus of the gameplay is storytelling, and it actually uses a very streamlined minimalist rule system, allowing for true role-playing and character development. Extremely deep and thematic. This was certainly one of the key reasons that we are so excited about the prospect of bringing this world to life in a computer role-playing game. White Wolf's website has an excellent introductory document for those interested in getting a quick overview of the license and rules. So, the basic storyline as revealed by Ray last year. It deals with personal horror, which is a vampire story of one over-the-top church knight named Christoph Romuald, whose faith crumbles before him when first tested. He is forced to come to grips with what is the true meaning of good and evil, not the black and white. Ahem. Had an interruption. Where were we? Christoph Romuald whose faith crumbles before him when first tested. He is forced to come to grips with what is the true meaning of good and evil, not the black and white concept he's founded his beliefs upon. On an intimate level, it focuses on his own battle with his vampiric nature. There is also a deep and tragically doomed love involved that contributes to his fall. He is soon pulled into the hidden intrigues of the kindred and must find his way through the treachery, greed, and turbulence of the times. During his experience, he uncovers an ominous portent that could affect the world, the future, both kindred and humans alike. We've worked hard to capture all the elements that make the pen and the paper game system enjoyable and unique. White Wolf has worked with us closely on recreating their world of darkness on the PC. Basically, we love the license and don't want to see a half-baked or cheesy implementation more than any other hardcore Vampire the Masquerade player would. I think Ray goes into the player character and character development system, how it works... The uh, characters you encounter, their disciplines. Redemption website bills this the game as an action RPG. What is the basis for this designation? What kind of appeal will it have for very groups, such as hardcore CRPG gamers and pen and paper players? See, folks, action RPG meant different things in 1999 than it does in the year of our Lord 2024. Think about that. It's been 25 years, man! It's older than some of my viewers. <laughs> Ugh. <laughs> the Vampire of the Masquerade license is incredibly malleable and is enjoyed on many different levels. That's true. Dice rolling tabletop games, lots of combat, large scale live action games played out in the street. And lots of stuff. Major multiplayer component and that cooperative and hunter hunted modes are just some of the planned features. Well, that's a big innovation that's been kept under wraps since the start of the project. Hunter hunted modes, huh? Hmm. Well, not every planned feature makes it to release. 
We then have a vampire team interview with Callie Girl of RPG Extreme. Uh, delving in with four folks, Ray, Robert, Anthony, and Brent. Which uh, is, you know, some polite banter designed, you know, to keep interest in the game remaining in people's brains. They don't forget about it. Talking about Vampire Masquerade and what it's about. For people reading about this game for the first time, where did it come from? What's been the hardest part in developing the game? Creating an RPG is always a huge undertaking. Add onto that multiple time frames, four vast cities, and an enormous amount of characters, and it adds up to a lot of work. Most of the development has been great fun, however, and seeing the game approach the design step by step has been very rewarding. Getting everyone to agree on some of the trickier design points is the hardest part. We're a small team, so everyone has a voice when deciding things. Some decisions, like whether to use a point and click interface or a drive the character interface, lead to some long heated debates within the company. Normally, rather than just taking a vote on something like that, we prefer to argue about it for a couple hours until someone gives in. Lots of things like control schemes, interface layouts, etc. have been subjected to this grueling process. Targeting a winter 1999 release? Hmm. When has that happened before? <laughs> right? Yes. It will be released by this point. Damn, I can't believe it wasn't released by this point. You see, it was still true back then! What do you feel sets Vampire the Masquerade from... apart? from other role-playing games. The most obvious answer is that you get to play a vampire with all the advantages and curses that come along with it. The other difference that sets vampire apart is the type of role-playing involved. White Wolf turned the role-player's eye inward to explore strife and anguish, guilt, and greed. The decisions you make in vampire can affect your character's spiritual outcome just as much as how well they swing an axe, for example. The interpersonal side of this kind of role-playing is important, since an enemy made in the Dark Ages is likely to still be around in the modern day. Role-playing an immortal character seems to put more weight behind every decision. Two of our earliest design ideas were the storyteller-based multiplayer scheme and the idea of setting the game in both the Dark Ages and modern day time periods. And those two ideas give the game a very unique edge to it. We've stuck to most of our early gut-feeling design choices, and so far they have paid off well. Visually, we've set the bar very high with this product. Our goal was to make the RPG look as rich and detailed as any 3D game on the market. And then multiplayer support... Weapons and spells, set of system requirements, which haven't been set down yet. A favorite tune or food that you have while developing the game. Name your five favorite games of all time. I'm interested to see this, actually. Doom, Resident Evil, Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, Eye of the Beholder, and Mario 64. Civilization, XCOM, Half-Life, Populous, and Star Control 2. Yeah! Duke Nukem 3D, Wizardry, Doom, Star Saga 1, Beyond the Boundary, and Wing Commander 1. In no particular order, Doom, TIE Fighter, Star Siege Tribes, yes! <laughs> Quick and <laughs> oh, I actually got sent an offer to get early access for Tribes 3. And I was like, Tribes? Like, what? That, they're bringing that back? <laughs> I played so much Tribes. It was all fun and games. Oh! Till my brother sold the CD. <laughs> <laughs> Anguish, agony, <laughs> despair. He was like, but I kept the Planescape Torment CD. In fairness, like, it was his game. He bought it. There were things he sold that were not his to sell, like our Sega Genesis and our Shadowrun game cartridge and our Road Rash 2 game cartridge. But, but that, yeah. On that note, Vampire of the Masquerade Redemption was actually his purchase, too. And I'm the one who got that. Eh. Sometimes you lose, sometimes you win, right? Uh. Did you have a chance to see any cool games or get the E3? Any favorites yet? Anachronox. Yes, Anachronox. <laughs> Tribes 2? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That one, that one didn't hit me as well. Oni! Playing a shitty game called Oni. Killing some dudes. I did a playthrough of that. Damn near a decade ago at this point. Whew. Anyway. That was our vampire team interview. That actually hit harder than what I thought I would. I just thought I would be in it, like, including this for some fluff. And it was fluffy. But uh, that, that sparks some memories for me. Ahem. <clears throat> At E3 this past May, the RPG that garnered the most attention to claim was probably Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, shown at the booth of publisher Activision. 
The first game to be developed by Nihilistic Software, it is based on the Vampire the Masquerade tabletop franchise from White Wolf Game Studio. Despite being a very popular property among pen and paper role players, it is still unfamiliar to many CRPG fans. Accordingly, I was very pleased when Ray Moon God Gresco, project leader in Redemption, agreed to provide an introduction to the pen and paper game that is the foundation for his team's computer title. So we talk about the principal focus of the game, a large focus on storytelling, and challenges its players to experience the personal horror at becoming an unliving entity which is slowly losing the remaining strands of humanity. So each character comes pre-built with a tragic flaw, making for more interesting and dramatic roles. In addition, the player is thrust into a world rife with conflict, as each vampire clan seeks to promote, promote its own ideology and control over each other. It's this focus on truly playing the role of your character on a personal level that I think has helped to capture the large audience, in addition to the depth and creativity used in setting the background setting and story. Because of this focus and the minimal rule system, Vampire the Masquerade is played in a variety of ways. Games range from dice rolling tabletop sessions to full on LARP. Vampire and its players have taken live action play to a new level, and you'll find troops playing in the streets of towns and cities across the world. That, that didn't really happen so much where I live. But you know, cities of town, streets of towns and cities, yeah, yeah. Older players adopt. Some of the clans, can a player play a non-vampire character? They're supplementary guides, but it's, it's for multiplayer, not single player. How do character creation and development work? And it goes a bit into how it works uh, when you're sitting down at the table and not at Vampire the Masquerade Redemption. But as White Wolf mentions, the character creation system is intended more as a persona development device than as a strict system of mechanical codification. Much focus is spent in the manuals on helping players create deep and interesting characters that are fun to roleplay. And then we have a redemption design log, worked on by Ray, worked on by Rob. I think it's just been Ray and Rob, but I cannot swear to that. There. Those four bits. And I'm not going to go into reading all of the sections of this. We have spent more time than what I thought I would. <laughs> More time than what I thought I would at delving into those bits, particularly given uh, that I intended to read at length uh, the last prepared material, the postmortem. So, uh, don't worry. Future Grimoth will take care of you with links into the Wayback Machine uh, for you to go about reading this stuff on your own. At least some of these tabs I've provided, if not all of them. And I will scroll up and down here. If you're interested in looking at the development of the game, you know, leading up to the actual release of the game, you know, we gotta, we gotta get something to occupy uh, potential consumers since the game is not coming out in winter 1999. Some of the, uh, the sketches and art did actually get preserved and such did get saved to my computer. Huzzah. Been a year and a half, and we are in crunch mode. Yeah. Looks like this one was about art, so this one was definitely not uh, Ray and Rob. So far, Ray has talked, and Rob, yeah, yeah. Art team. And then back to Ray here at the end. The promise, the skinny, the grail, the archetype, the words, the possibilities, the ongoing battle. Yeah. And then... The Vampire Launch Party Report. What does that ad say? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know... <laughs> I looked at all these pages in advance, obviously, in preparing for this bonus episode. I did save them to my computer from the Wayback Machine after finding them, and yet... There's some details that just... Man. 2000, right? The game system's so big it needs its own planet. Planet Dreamcast. <laughs> the Vampire Launch Party Report. Jamie Madigan was lucky enough to be able to attend the recent Vampire Launch Party in San Francisco. Here is his report. Following are some photos of the event, which uh, will actually take us into the internet for me to click on. 
The power of the Wayback Machine. Oh, look at that. Look at these monitors displaying Vampire the Masquerade Redemption as it was meant to be shown. Not on these damn flat screen monitors. Look at that. And look at the rest of the pictures in your own time. With Vampire the Masquerade Redemption flying off the shelves like bats from the sunlight, Nihilistic Software and Activision have a lot of reasons to celebrate. And what better way to celebrate than throwing a launch party? Sponsored by Activision and Nihilistic, the event was thrown as an opportunity for the vampire and gaming communities to celebrate the launch of this fantastic, in my honest opinion, title, and as a way for fans to run elbows with one another and see what's going on in the fledgling, pardon the pun, but strong vampire community. Since Game Spy Industries received an invite, since the party was only a short plane ride away in San Francisco, I grabbed my bags, a digital camera, a few cloves of garlic, and headed out. Here's a rundown of what went on. I... Ah, oh, imagine being able to take a few cloves of garlic with you. Under the airplane. Or packed in your luggage. What a time to be alive. Actually, Grimmer, if you could do the top no. Shh, shh, shh. The party was held in downtown San Francisco at the corner of Harrison and First, if you're from there. Listen, you gotta sneeze or what while I'm reading? Thank you. In a large open warehouse area, the whole place was done up with red lights, decorations, and black tablecloths, which went a long way towards establishing a dark and gothic atmosphere. There were also projectors that displayed the Vampire the Masquerade Redemption logo all over the walls as well as the Activision logo. Despite the heat, no air conditioning, and 95 degrees out. There were a lot of people in attendance, even if most of them were hanging out outside near the stairway where it was a bit cooler. To make the atmosphere complete, there was a DJ playing some nice techno tunes that reminded me a lot of the music we hear in the game's Modern Nights chapters. And of course, there was food and drink. Activision went all out and had a nice open bar where you could quench your burning thirst with everything from soda to cocktails to a nice glass of blood red Merlot. The food they put out was also not bad. Instead of rats like our friends Kristoff and company have to die on, <laughs> we got to sample all sorts of veggies, sandwiches, and other appetizers. Much better than the still warm blood of your mesmerized and hapless victim. Sorta. I was a little disappointed, though, in how much treatment the actual game got at the party. There were four PCs set up in the corner where you could sit down and play the game, but I got the feeling that most of us there were already fans of the title and had already been playing it for a while. Some people did sit down, and the guys from Nihilistic were more than happy to run through a demo of the game for you, but there wasn't any new information there. I'd been hoping that maybe they would have more PC set up, maybe spring a new custom multiplayer adventure on us, or at least coordinate a multiplayer game or two with some talented storytellers. This is the only aspect of the game I haven't been able to really get into, since I haven't been able to find anyone who has had the time and talent to run a really good custom adventure. Given that the game is so new, though, there's still plenty of time for this part of the community to develop. So there you have it. It was a good party, and a nice chance for fans of the game and those in the gaming business to get together and chat about the game and the industry in general, with games like Vampire on store shelves and others like Baldur's Gate 2, Neverwinter Nights, and Dungeon Siege, which, if memory serves, does end up having better pathfinding than Vampire the Masquerade Redemption, despite having a party size of 8. Though, it does have its jank too, I digress. Things look really great for the RPG community, and it's nice to see Nihilistic and Activision realize that supporting a community of players and websites is important. This is Grimmith in real time, looking at how much time he has spent on this up to this point, and considering maybe final thoughts in another episode? I mean, I did it for Final Liberation. It was good enough for Final Liberation. Yeah, I, I got more into this than I thought I would. Okay, we're calling an ab lib. Run in the back. Fuck you, Pass Grim. If you're already a lion sack of shit, we're not editing anything. <laughs> okay. From Rob. August 2nd, 2000. Hosted on Gama Sutra. And dredged out from the Wayback Machine. When Nihilistic Software was founded in 1998, there were only two things we knew were certain. The first was that we wanted to form a company with a small number of very experienced game developers. The second was that we wanted to make a killer role-playing game. Nihilistic got started without much fanfare, just a few phone calls and emails. After finishing work on Jedi Knight for LucasArts, the core team members had, for the most part, gone their separate ways and moved on to different teams over different companies. About eight months after Jedi Knight shipped, various people in the original team began to gravitate together again, and eventually formed Nihilistic just a few exits down Highway 101, in Marin County, California, from our previous home. 
Having moved into our new offices and bolted together a dozen desks from Ikea, our first project was to build a 3D RPG based on White Wolf's pen and paper franchise, Vampire the Masquerade. Before linking up with Activision as our publisher, Nihilistic President Ray Gresco already had a rough design and story prepared for an RPG with similar themes and a dark gothic feel. After Activision approached us about using the White Wolf license, we adapted parts of this design to fit the World of Darkness universe presented in White Wolf's collection of source books, and this became the initial design for Redemption. Because of our transition from first and third person action games to RPGs, we approached our first design in some unique ways. Many features that are taken for granted in action games, such as a rich, true 3D environment, 3D characters, and the ability for users to make add-ons or modifications, were reflected in our project proposal. We also adopted many conventions of the first-person shooter genre, such as freeform 3D environments, ubiquitous multiplayer support, and fast real-time pacing. To this, we added the aspects of traditional role-playing games that we found most appealing. A mouse-driven point-and-click interface, character development, and a wide variety of characters, items, and environments for exploration. Professional conceptual art, such as this rendering of Alessandro Giovanni by contractor Patrick Lambert, helped the characters evolve as the art design took shape. Using the White Wolf license also meant that our users would have high expectations in terms of story, plot, and dialogue for the game. It's a role-playing license based heavily around dramatic storytelling, intense political struggles, and personal interaction. Fans of the license would not accept a game that was mere stat building and gold collecting. In keeping with our basic philosophy, we built up a staff of 12 people over the course of the project's 24-month development cycle. The budget for the game was fairly modest by today's standards, about $1.8 million. The budget was intentionally kept low for the benefit of both Nihilistic and our publisher. We wanted our first project to be simple and manageable, rather than compounding the complexities of starting a company by doing a huge first project. Also, we were looking to maximize potential benefits if the game proved successful. For its part, Activision was new to the RPG market and was testing the waters with RPGs and the White Wolf license in particular, so they probably considered the venture fairly high risk as well. Development started around April 1998 when we began. We examined several engine technologies available, such as the Unreal Engine and the Quake Engine, but ultimately decided against licensing our engine technology. The game we envisioned, using a mouse-driven point-and-click interface, had a lot more in common with games such as StarCraft than even the best first-person engines. We decided to create a new engine focused specifically on the type of game we wanted to create, and targeted 3D accelerated hardware specifically bypassing the tremendous amount of work required to support non-accelerated PCs in the 3D engine. As an added benefit, the company would own the technology internally, allowing us to reuse the code base freely for future projects, or license it to other developers. Page 2. What went right? 1. Letting the artists and designers pick their tools. With such a small team and tight budget, boosting the team's efficiency was our primary focus, if bad tools or art paths slowed down progress in the art or level design departments, we would have no choice of hitting our milestones. When we started to map the development project, our programmers gravitated toward using a package such as 3D Studio Max for both art and level design. Our argument was that doing everything in a single package would increase portability of assets between levels and art, and save the company money by licensing a single relatively inexpensive tool. Thankfully, however, our leads in these areas strongly objected to this plan. They argued for allowing each develop department to use the tools that allowed them to do their work most efficiently. This single decision probably accounted for more time saved than any other. The level designers cited QE Radiant as their tool of choice, since most of them had previously done work with id software wink, on Quake mission packs. ID was generous in allowing us to license the, the QE Radiant source code and modify it to make a tool customized to our 3D RPG environments. Because it was a finished, functional tool even before we wrote our own export module, the level designers were able to create levels for the game immediately, even before an engine existed. And since it stores its data in generic files that store brush positions, the levels were easily tweaked and re-exported as the engine began to take shape. If the level designers had spent the first six months of the project waiting for the programmers to create a level editing tool or learning how to create levels in a 3D art tool, we would not have been able to complete the more than 100 level environments in 24 months with just three designers. <laughs> Locations included both interior and exterior cityscapes, allowing dramatic situations such as this battle atop a clock tower in medieval Prague. Yes, battle atop a clock tower. Look at Christos' hair in that, man. Woo! <laughs> mm. 
multiplayer, I reckon. Or, you know, testing. I digress. On the art side, the lead artist lobbied hard for the adoption of... Hello, I am Elias. No, alias Wavefront Tools for 3D Art. We tried to convince him that a less expensive tool would work just as well, but in the end we decided to allow the art department to use what they felt would be the most efficient tool for the job. Since Maya was just being released for Windows NT at that time, the cost of using that tool set were not as great as we feared, and allowed the artist the, to produce an incredible number of 3D art assets for the project. During the 24 months of the project, an art department of four people produced nearly 1,500 textured models. A mind-boggling figure using any tool. Two of what went right. Small team, one project, one room. Looks at time. Nods grimly. <laughs> When we started Nihilistic, we had a theory that a small number of highly experienced developers would be able to produce a title more efficiently than a larger team with fewer battle scars. In my experience, successfully delivering a game is less about what you do and more about what you choose not to do. Most games that ship late do so because the development team went down one or more blind alleys, development ideas, or strategies that for whatever reason didn't pan out. And the work done in that direction is lost. As a small team on a tight budget, we cannot afford to lose valuable time on these diversions. Experienced team members have the wisdom to look down a particular path and recognize when it's a likely dead end. Developers that have shipped commercial titles also know when enough is enough, so to speak. There's a rampant problem in this industry of feature creep, when games end up trying to be all things to all people and wind up taking four years to complete. Seasoned developers know that shipping a title is all about compromise. Any title that goes out the door could always be just a little better. And developers, ever the perfectionists, are never fully satisfied with the box on the shelf. Creating a successful game that ships on time requires a discipline to draw that line and move on to the next challenge. We also knew that we wanted an office environment where all the team members were in a single room without any walls, doors, and or offices whatsoever. This didn't really seem like a radical decision. Many of us got our start working for teams that operated like this, but it seems like these sorts of companies are becoming less and less common in today's industry. My first game job was working at Parallax, now Volition Software. We were eight people sitting along one wall of a narrow office space in Illinois. Even the original Dark Forces development team was sequestered in a one-room studio in a building separate from most of the other LucasArts teams. This type of environment doesn't just foster, but rather forces communication between all parts of the team. For instance, a programmer can overhear a discussion between two artists about how to proceed with something and be able to jump in with an answer that will save the project days or months of work. This sort of thing happens on a daily basis. Artists correct missteps by the technology team before they are made, a level designer can immediately show a bug to a programmer, and so on. Each of these incidents represents hours or days of project time saved. In an office environment with walls and doors, most of these situations would go unnoticed or unaddressed. 3. Using Java as a scripting engine We knew from the start that allowing the user community to edit the game was an important part of the design. After working in the first-person action game market, we saw the benefits of supporting the user community and wanted to carry this idea over into role-playing games, where it is not the norm. A built-in scripting system makes a game engine much more extendable by fans. In Jedi Knight, we created our own customized game language. Creating COG took a lot of effort from the development team. Several months of work went into creating the compiler, testing the generated code, and implementing the runtime kernel used to execute the scripts. The end result was worth it, but it cost a lot in terms of time and resources to pull it off. For more about COG, see my article, Adding Languages to Game Engine, September 1997. Ambitious design included parties of up to four 3D characters, each with interchangeable weapons and armor. Look at, uh, look at Pink there with that fucking chain gun. Hell yeah. When starting Vampire, we looked for ways to incorporate a scripting engine more easily than creating our own from scratch yet again. There were several scripting systems we examined and tested. At about that time, another game development company, Rebel Boat Rocker Software, was getting a lot of attention for its use of Java technology. After exchanging a few emails with lead programmer, we decided to give Java a try. Up to this point, I knew very little of Java and had largely dismissed it as a language suitable only for making icons dance on a web page and the like. A set of four interactive 3D head models at the bottom of the screen are skinned and animated in real time to give lifelike status for each party member. After a crash course in Java, we did a few simple tests incorporating it into our game engine. It passed each one with flying colors. In a matter of a few weeks, we had solved the major challenges involved in interfacing a standard, freely distributable Java virtual machine to our 3D RPG engine. From that point on, the only maintenance required was to add new native functions to the scripting language, which we did whenever we, had, we added new engine functionality that we wanted to expose to the script writers. We also trained several designers in the use of the scripting language, and they started creating the hundreds of small scripts that would eventually drive the storyline of the game. Ever since those initial tests, I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop, so to speak. 
I expected to come to work one day and find out that the Java thread was chewing up 100 megabytes of RAM or eating 50% of the CPU time. But amazingly, the system was trouble three throughout development and never became a significant resource drain. If for some reason we had hit a dead end with the Java system late in the project, it would have easily taken three to four months to get back on track using a different scripting technology. In the end, the gamble paid off. We saved months of programmer time that would otherwise been devoted to creating a scripting environment. The result was a system significantly more efficient and robust than any we could have created ourselves. All of the more than 100 3D characters, such as Lucretia, a Sedite priestess, were modeled and animated by hand by a team of four artists using Maya. Four of what went right. Storyteller mode. Throughout the project, the design slowly took shape through a series of meetings that involved the entire staff. Each new design was presented to the group and subjected to a sometimes heated discussion. This process of open discussion and free exchange of ideas resulted in a lot of the most interesting design aspects of the game. It was in one of our earliest design meetings that we came up with the idea of developing the multiplayer aspect of the gun dungeon, or the game, not as a typical deathmatch or cooperative system, but rather to create a storyteller or dungeon master system. The idea was inspired by the venerable text-based multi-user dungeon games that date from a calmer time and the history of the internet. Many of us at Nihilistic had played MUDs in college, often to the detriment of our studies. One thing that made MUDs so appealing was the ability for wizards, high-ranking users of the MUD, to manipulate the game environment and create virtual adventures for the players in real time. The vampire license from White Wolf emphasizes the role of the storyteller or moderator, so we felt the time was right to take the style of play out of the college computer lab and into a commercial role-playing game. Implementing the storyteller system turned out to be fairly simple from a technology standpoint. Most of the basic functionality for a storyteller game is identical to what would be required in a traditional client-server multiplayer game. The added cost was mostly in the area of design and the user interface. It took a bit of experimentation and redesign to arrive at an interface that was powerful enough to run games as a storyteller without being overly confusing to the novice player. The UI work included new interface panels with lists of objects, actors, and other resources, and a few buttons to manipulate the selected resources. Our overall design goal for the user interface was to ensure that important functionality was accessible using only the mouse, and all keyboard functionality represented only advanced controls such as hotkeys and shortcuts. Even though the storyteller system is something used primarily by advanced players, we wanted to preserve this design goal, which meant quite a bit of extra UI work to make a mouse-driven interface pow pow powerful enough to drive a storyteller game. In the end, the storyteller features ended up being one of the gems of the game design, and resonated with both the press and gamers alike. Activision made good use of the feature in their PR and marketing campaigns, and we hope the expandability and storyteller aspects of the game will give the game an increased shelf life. The fifth of what went right, using experienced contractors. One problem with our strategy of using a small core team is that we couldn't possibly cover all the aspects of designing a commercial game with just 12 people. Instead, we relied heavily on external contractors for certain key aspects of the game. Sound was one area where we made use of external talent, our colleagues from LucasArts referred Nick Peck to us based on his excellent work on Tim Schafer's Grim Fandango. Nick ended up not only supplying us with sound effects, but also working on some of the additional voice recording and ambient loops. For our music, we teamed up with Kevin Manthe, who scored the Dark Ages portion of the game, and with Youth Engine, a local duo for the modern-day tracks. Even in the conceptual stages, we used external artists to help us sketch and visualize the game. Peter Chan was the lead conceptual artist for Jedi Knight and had subsequently become an independent contractor. His work in the first months of the project was key in establishing the look of the game's environments. We also worked with Patrick Lambert for character concepts, and he delivered incredibly detailed full-color drawings that really brought the characters to life for the modelers and animators. Perhaps the most critical external relationship was with oh Oho Loco, a small startup spun off from Cyclone Studios. We hired them to do our cinematic sequences that introduced the story and provide the endings. While starting the project, we met with several firms specializing in computer animation, but pretty much across the board, their rates were well beyond our budgets for that part of the game. It seems that the high demand for commuter, computer animation for movies and television has driven the larger firm's prices beyond the reach of typical game budgets. By working with a smaller, less established company, we are able to get more bang for our buck in our cinematics, and the results prove to be of the highest quality. Looks at time in video again and grits teeth. <clears throat> okay. Speed read? Let's go. <clears throat> what went wrong? 
overly ambitious design, much like this video. <laughs> In retrospect, we were in some ways our own worst enemy. Many of the team members had wanted for some time to do a really huge, ambitious role-playing game. When we actually started the project and had a budget and a schedule, we probably weren't realistic about how long RPGs typically take to develop, especially ones that travel to four different cities across an 800-year time frame. We were very reluctant to make big cuts in the design, such as cutting one of the two time periods or removing the multiplayer aspect. Because of this, we eventually had to make the decision to miss our first scheduled release date of March 2000. We also cut back on our plans to release an interactive demo some months before the game and scaled back the scope of the multiplayer beta. Fortunately, by expanding the schedule a few months, we were able to preserve almost all the elements from the initial design, but to accomplish this, the art and design departments really had to work above and beyond the Call of Duty for an extended period of time. We did cut a back a bit in the area of multiplayer by removing the ability to play through the entire single-player scenario cooperatively as a team, and instead replaced that with two smaller, custom-made multiplayer scenarios using levels and art from the single-player game. Part of this was because we did not plan properly for multiplayer when making some of the JavaScripts that drive the single-player game. If the multiplayer game had been functional earlier in the schedule, the single-player game scripts might have been written from the start to be multiplayer-friendly, and we could have shipped more multiplayer content in the box. Characters were created with a budget of between 1,000 and 3,000 triangles. Boss characters such as Ozra and the Zemitsi Elder were generally the most complex. This is my first time reading this text as the Zemitsi Elder. Boy, that really shapes that whole confrontation in the Bond Silver Mines, huh? Ooh. <laughs> hmm. I have read this before, multiple times, and that's the first time I've just processed the Meatsy Elder. Prototyping with a proprietary API. When we started developing the 3D engine for the game, which we named Nod, the 3D API landscape was quite a bit different from how it is now. We decided to use Glide as an initial prototyping API with the belief that it would be a more stable platform and avoid the complexities of supporting multiple hardware through a more general API until we had solidified the engine a bit. However, once we had a basic functional engine running using running under Glide, the programmer's attention toward, turned toward gameplay and functionality rather than switching the graphics engine to a more general API such as Direct3D or OpenGPGL. Because of this it-if-it-ain't-broke mindset, we expanded our support beyond Glide fairly late in development. At the first public showing of the game at E3 in 1999, we were still basically a Glide-only game, which meant we couldn't demonstrate the game in 32-bit modes or support some features not present in Glide at the time. The extensive use of Glide also gave us some unrealistic performance estimates for other hardware. Since Glide allows low-level access to things like texture memory management, we spent significant time writing our own optimized texture manager. When we switched to Direct3D, most of this work had to be discarded. Since Glide allows more flexible ver vertex formats than Direct3D, some of our underlying data structures needed to be changed, which meant re-exporting hundreds of levels of models. We were making low-level architectural engine changes at a stage when the engine should have been pretty much locked down. Also, because we switched late in our development schedule, we probably didn't spend as much time as we should have on compatibility testing with a wide variety of hardware. In retrospect, we should have switched to Direct3D or OpenGL several months earlier in the development schedule. 3. Pathfinding Difficulties One problem we identified early in the development process was a problem of pathfinding. Navigation of variably sized characters through a completely three-form 3D environment is one of the most difficult problems I've had to tackle as a game programmer. Unit navigation is hard enough when you have a flat 2D plane or restricted 3D environment, but in an environment where the level designers are free to make stairs, ramps, or any other 3D construct you could imagine, the problem becomes exponentially more difficult. My natural tendency when presented with such a sticky problem is, unfortunately, to make it good enough for the early milestone and demo builds, and then just deal with it later. Unfortunately, later quickly became now, and now turned into yesterday. Real-time continuous level detail allowed models to appear highly detailed in close-ups without sacrificing speed and longer shots. We should have tackled this problem much earlier. Before the levels were near completion, we should have worked with the level designers to come up with a set of restrictions for their levels or some additional tagging in the editors specified to the engine where characters should and should not move. Instead, the only hints from this level design tool were walkable floor flags, but little or no special marking of walls, cliffs, and other pathing hazards. Since we waited too long to address the problem, better solutions such as walk boxes or walk zones would have taken too long to retrofit into the more than 100 levels already in the can. Instead, we spent weeks making small iterative fixes to the system to hide the most extreme errors and turn what was an A bug into a B or C level problem. Number four, feature and data timing. This is a fairly common problem in games I've worked on and Vampire was no different. The technology team typically looks at the development schedule and schedules that entire block of time to achieve a certain feature set. Often, however, new engine features get added too late in the schedule to be utilized fully by designers and artists. This happened several times during Vampire. Some of the more interesting special effects, for example, were added only a few weeks before the data was to be locked down for final testing. 
Other features that we added couldn't even be implemented extensively. For example, we added a more flexible shader language so late that only 1-2% to of the surfaces in the game were able to take advantage of it. Some features that we had originally planned for the engine, like bump mapping and specular lighting, were cut completely for the initial release because they were insufficient time both to complete the feature and to create art to drive it. We softened the blow somewhat by moving some of these features to a planned patch, which would add them later if the game proved successful. Unfortunately, there are very few programming tasks that don't require some sort of artist or designer input to find their way into the finished product. So unless programmers spend the last six months of the project doing nothing but fixing bugs, some of this is inevitable. We can justify it to a degree by looking toward the likely sequel or add-on projects as a way to take advantage of some of the engine work that was underutilized in the original title. In 5 of what went wrong, self-restraint. As the project was drawing to a close, we found that we ended up with a bit too much game, as someone put it. From the start, we decided to offer our data, author our data, for a high-end platform, so we'd have a good-looking game at the end of the 24-month schedule, and also because it's much easier to scale art down than up. Unfortunately, we never really started to rein in our art and design teams when we should have near the middle of the project. Instead, we continued to add more and more resources to the project, resulting in a minimum installation footprint of about 1 gigabyte. We authored all our textures in 32-bit color and then scaled them down at load times for 16-bit cards. Our models were also extremely detailed 1,000 to 2,000 triangles each on average and relied on automatic level of detail algorithms to scale them down for slower machines. We lit our levels with relatively high light map resolutions. All this made the game look great on high-end systems, but it meant the game was fairly taxing on low- to mid-range systems. In the end, the game just barely fit on two CD-ROMs. The game's story unfolds mainly via in-game cutscenes. The excellent models allow for the creation of intricate details such as individual fingers. Yes, individual fingers, nods emphatically, which help make these scenes feel like pre-rendered cinematics. We had originally planned to include both 16-bit and 32-bit versions of the game textures and allow players to choose which version to install. But after all the art was completed, there was no room on the CD for more than one version. Likewise, for sounds, we wanted to include multiple quality levels, but space prevented this. We actually compressed most of the voice samples with MP3 and had to remove several sounds from the game in order to fit it on two CDs. In the end, our game looked gorgeous, but had difficulty running on machines with less than 128 megabytes of RAM. And even then, it used a fair amount of space on a swap drive. This glut of resources will also make it more difficult if we choose to port the game to a more limited console environment. At last, redemption. For the first project from a new development startup, I can't imagine how things could have gone much better than they did, except perhaps if we could have avoided shipping it the same year as Diablo 2. Yeah. <laughs> as a company, we managed to accomplish the three most important things in this business. Not running out of money, not losing any team members, and actually shipping the product. Our publishers remained committed to the project throughout its life cycle, and even increased their support as the project continued to take shape. The course of development was amazingly smooth, with very few surprises or conflicts along the way. In this industry, you can almost bet that at some point in a two-year development cycle, something traumatic will happen to either the development team or its publisher. But for us, the waters were remarkably calm. About the most exciting thing to happen during development was when we lost our entire RAID server while attempting to add drivers to it, resulting in a loss of a few months' worth of archived emails. Our good fortune allowed the team to focus strictly on the game and prevented distractions from outside the company also keeping our company focused on just one title and resisting the frequent temptation to take on more work and more staff allowed everyone to be on the same team with little or no secondary distractions. Hopefully, by avoiding feature creep and a four-year death march kind of ending to the saga, we can avoid a lot of the burnout that we have seen and often experience on other teams. By maintaining links with both the fan community through our web board, with the developer community at large by attending shows like GDC, E3, and SIGGRAPH, our team was able to keep a positive attitude and high energy level throughout the schedule. We remain convinced that small development teams with a single title focus are the best way to ship quality titles consistently, so our plans moving forward are to staff up gradually from 12 to perhaps 16 people for the next four months and embark on our next two-year ordeal a little older, a little wiser, just a tiny bit larger. Okay. <sighs> Thank you, Robert Hubner, a co-founder and lead programmer in Nihilistic Software. Anyway, this... this... <laughs> yeah, right. Next time... In bonus, bonus time, my final thoughts. Grimace, this was overambitious. What is wrong with you?